We're struggling to reach the Millennium Development Goals. And any discussion about international development has to start with the billion people who don't get enough to eat, with the 1.3 or 4 billion who live below uh, $1.25 a day. You know, those are real people with real stories, uh, with real children suffering real hunger and suffering real health effects. And when you come face to face with people, as we all do, then you realize how urgent that task is. And their task has been made more difficult by the crisis we're living through in terms of the food, fuel and financial crises, which have really shaken us in developing countries. I think we need to turn that conversation on its head and start talking about capability indicators. How well equipped are the countries that we work with to deal with this rapid pace of change? And it's going to be measured not just by balance of payments and fiscal position, but also by the business environment, uh, by the level of the infrastructure. How many, for example, internet startups have there been in a country in the last 10 years? That's a good indicator of whether a country is open and dynamic uh, and able to change. Whatever else you do, don't cut education, don't cut investment in infrastructure, because those are the things you're going to need. The state has a really important role to play as the guarantor of social protection, as you rightly said, and as a source of expenditure. We can't cut public expenditure too far. How to make a state capable? Higher financial regulation, investment in social protection, hang on to public services, Invest in research and development, especially in green issues, because that's obviously an important part of it. Um, invest in education and training and infrastructure. Support the productive sectors um, and invest more in aid. You don't hear any of this very much in the IMF uh, discussion, as far as I can see, but it's a very important part of the UN's contribution to the heterodox um, um, analysis. I said that collective action was on my list. You look at all the problems I listed and look at the financial crisis. Malta is a great country, but there is no way Malta can solve those problems on its own. I don't think. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, the UK is a very great country as well. Of course, there's no way we can solve it on our own. Everything leads us into the collective sphere. And for those of you who are diplomats, I think this is good news because actually the future of development is about collective action. And who manages collective action? The diplomats. Now, all this leads to a new model of development cooperation, and I've put a picture here, not because it's the only example, but because it's a recent example. The new UK government position, which is called Eliminating World Poverty, Building Our Common Future. Common Future, making this very strong case for both the moral imperative and social justice and self-interest. Why I think it's really valuable to be having this discussion in Malta. Not just because you're a member of the European Union that has come into the development cooperation business with, I think, some flair and vision as you laid out and as I saw in the development policy, but also because Malta's own experience illustrates uh, some of the problems of development and offers many solutions to development. Characteristically in development, we worry about small open economies. Uh, Malta is a small open economy. It has suffered some radical shocks during the course of the last generation or two, uh, when suddenly ships were able to get from Gibraltar to Cairo without stopping. This was a real blow to the Maltese economy. You had to reconfigure your economy to find a new niche. You've today found a number of important niches, including tourism, which is seen as a really good avenue for growth also in developing countries. Um, and you are struggling, as you have already heard, with some of the problems right at the heart of the current development agenda, like uh, migration. You've also, in Malta, made a very important contribution internationally, and one of your ways of finding a niche has to be recognised as being to be recognised as leaders on diplomacy, uh, in, for example, the law of the sea, um, in the work you did early on climate change, uh, and I think those are very much appreciated, and you... you um, deserve a lot of credit, but you also have very much to teach uh, developing countries. And 
as I'll illustrate during the course of the lecture, some of those characteristics that Malta has today are exactly where the development conversation is leading us uh, for the future. So I, I'm glad to see that you are so well positioned at the cutting edge of a new conversation. And the thing that always amazes me when you go around Europe is how much history there is. I mean, I live in a town called Brighton, south of London. The most exciting thing that ever happened in Brighton was that the French burned the village to the ground in 1517 or so. So in the last 450 years, nothing has happened in Brighton. When you go to Hungary or you come to Malta, you realise that that is not the case everywhere. There is enormous benefit in having had the European Union to deliver peace and stability uh, in Europe. So I think we have to say to ourselves that although life is very difficult, we should be optimistic about the future. <coughs> but, um, uh, Martin Luther King gave his famous speech, I have a dream. He did not stand up and say to everybody, you know, I need you to mobilize, I have a nightmare. Uh, he gave people a vision of hope. So I thought again about those children standing, shivering on the edge of the swimming pool. Uh, and then I thought to myself, we should be optimistic. Uh, so here they are with a smile on their face, uh, jumping in. I think that's what we need to do. We have to have a smile on our face and we should jump in. Thank you.